In order to keep the uh, opening ceremony on schedule, we will be starting now with our uh, most important lecture for this conference for Professor David Cooper. I have the honor to introduce him in few words. He's a professor of human molecular genetics at Cardiff University. He graduated with a PhD in uh, molecular biology from Edinburgh in 1983, almost 30 years ago. And then he had postdoctoral um, research in Göttingen and Lausanne. And uh, he's holding his position in Cardiff since uh, 1995. His research interest is, well, uh, large. He focused on the elucidation of the mechanisms of mutagenesis, underlying human genetic disease, genotype-phenotype relationship in various inherited disorders, as well as human evolution and population genetics. Well, I personally, I was, I, I, I always admired his papers. He's author of more than 400 papers in the field of human molecular genetics. He edited a large number of books as well. And he currently curates the Human Gene Mutation Database, which is a comprehensive database of mutations causing human inherited disease. Today, Professor Cooper will speak to us about some of the abnormalities of Mendelian disorders, especially on penetrance, and his lecture will be the molecular basis of reduced penetrance in human inherited disease. Let's all welcome Professor David Cooper. Well, thank you very much, Ghazi, for your generous introduction. Um, thank you also to the organizers, um, the Center of Arab Genomic Studies and the um, uh, Golden Helix Foundation for their uh, invitation. I'm really delighted to be uh, here in Dubai and have the opportunity to talk to you about a topic which is um, becoming actually quite close to my heart, which is um, penetrance in human genetic disorders, or indeed um, variable penetrance, as we shall come to see. So uh, where do we start? Um, as Ghazi has already mentioned, um, part of my day job in Cardiff is to curate the Human Gene Mutation Database. And we first went on the web, made, made uh, these data publicly available um, to uh, fellow geneticists in, back in 1996. And over the intervening 17 years, we've um, acquired something over 140,000 different inherited mutations um, causing human inherited disease in a total of about uh, 5,700 different genes. So uh, um, quite a large proportion of the, say, 25 to 30,000 genes that we believe um, may um, uh, inhabit the human genome. Um, I don't want to say too much about um, uh, HGMD uh, today. Um, I want to focus on uh, uh, the, the topic of, um, uh, of uh, penetrance in, in human genetic disease. Uh, but one of, the, um, uh, one of the privileges, if you like, of um, um, curating a database uh, of this size and uh, also of this uh, utility for human geneticists is that we get um, quite a lot of feedback from the scientific community. And I would say that um, uh, about half of this feedback uh, approximates to fan mail telling us that um, what we're doing is wonderful and excellent and uh, um, uh, people are very grateful. And about half of it is, um, uh, well, if not hate mail, at least um, uh, mail that is um, um, suggesting that we do things in other ways or um, um, uh, suggesting uh, uh, ways in which we could do things better. So uh, one of the... Um, one of, the, ways, one, one of the, the criticisms that is often leveled at um, uh, the way we curate HGMD is as follows. People say the mutations, that are, or at least some of the mutations that appear in HGMD uh, also appear in the Thousand Genomes Project dataset. How can these mutations be disease-causing if they also appear in the general population? Uh, 
so uh, to us, this, um, this sort of question is, um, uh, is a bit puzzling because um, uh, the, the, the answers we feel should be a little obvious, but perhaps not in terms of um, having, a little, uh, having a closer look at um, what, the, what the real explanation is. So what we decided to do was um, uh, pay, a, uh, pay attention to some of this criticism. It's always, it's always better to pay, attention to, to pay closer attention to the criticism than to the praise, in my view. So, um, so what we did was we teamed up with Chris Tyler Smith's group at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge to do a proper formal analysis of the comparison between the Thousand Genomes Project data and our own HGMD data. And as you'll see from the... Um, I'm not sure, do I have a laser pointer here? Uh, ah, here we are. Um, as you'll see from um, this uh, summary of, um, of our analysis, this analysis, by the way, for those of you who are interested in the detail of it, was published in the December 2012 issue of the American Journal of Human Genetics. Um, what we did was to take uh, the whole genome sequences from 179 individuals from the Thousand Genomes pilot project, and we ascertained that each individual carried between about 280 and 500 different missense substitutions. Now, about 70% of these had uh, a minor allele frequency of more than 5%. So, clearly these are, uh, are not likely to be mutations of uh, major uh, effect. Between 40 and 110 variants per individual were classified by HGMD as either disease-causing or as disease-associated. Now, interestingly, uh, between 3 and 24 of these occurred in the homozygous state, so we would expect some sort of impact on the phenotype of the individual in those cases. And finally, up to 8 mutations per individual were predicted to be highly damaging. So let's have a closer look at uh, what those mutations were in the overlap between HGMD and the Thousand Genomes Project. Well, only a, ve only a very small proportion uh, of, the, um, uh, of the mutations were in fact disease-causing mutations. And the vast majority were three types of polymorphism. And let me just, um, for those of you who are not familiar with HGMD, let me just run through these. Um, DP are what we term disease-causing polymorphisms. FP are what we call functional polymorphisms. And these are polymorphisms which appear to affect the, um, the expression of a gene or the uh, function of the gene product, but which are not known as yet to be disease-associated. And then there's a third category of polymorphism, which are the disease-associated functional polymorphisms, or the DFPs. So as we see, the vast majority of the overlap of um, mutational lesions that are in HGMD and the Thousand Genomes Project fit into one of these three polymorphism ca categories. And only uh, a relatively small proportion fit into the, the category of disease-causing mutations, the DMs. Uh, I should also point out that less than 1% of disease-causing mutations in HGMD were found to be present in the Thousand Genomes Project. So what we then did was to apply a range of different filters to uh, the lesions in the overlap zone. And what we, oops, what we found um, was that um, about three quarters of them were disease-causing um, uh, mutations that occurred uh, in the heterozygous uh, form, um, so only, uh, only one per genome. But these uh, were associated with recessive disorders, and so um, these essentially were, were, were carriers of um, a recessive allele that might well exert a, um, a disease effect. Um, when it occurred in the homozygous or compound heterozygous uh, form. So what we were left with, therefore, were only 11 variants 
which um, we, uh, we needed to, to show a further in interest in. Um, there were those, that were associated, those mutations that were associated with a dominant condition normally, and we found six of those um, in otherwise healthy individuals in the 1000 Genomes Project, and five mutations which um, were normally associated with a recessive disorder which occurred in the homozygous form. So we had a closer look at those, uh, those 11 variants, and we found that um, uh, 10 out of 11 had rather mild or late onset phenotypes associated with them. Um, so, for example, uh, this missense substitution is associated with heparin cofactor 2 deficiency, which is a very mild um, disorder, uh, which is associated with a slightly elevated um, risk of familial venous thrombosis. Um, similarly, uh, one of the variants um, was um, uh, associated with cardiomyopathy, which um, might well be expected to occur somewhat later in life. Interestingly, the, the remaining variant appears to um, uh, be possibly uh, exerting a different effect in different populations. So this is also a missense variant in the, uh, the, one of the Usher syndrome uh, genes. And this is certainly believed to be pathogenic in Europeans, but we found it in the 1000 Genomes Project in three Yoruba individuals of Nigerian origin. And interestingly, in that population, this very same gene has been known to be subject to um, uh, a copy number variation. So it may well be that the, uh, the mutation has been covered by a, a, a CNV, a copy number variant. But we'll come back to that, um, uh, that, that particular mechanism a little later. So we were interested um, in our load of mutations to coin um, Muller's um, classic um, phrase from his 1950 paper. Um, and in summary, we reckon that uh, the average individual probably contains about 400 damaging missense, individual, uh, missense variants. And about 100 of, about 100 of these are uh, loss of function variants. Um, so they knock out the, um, uh, the allele completely. Now this is a very different, a, a damaging in terms of, a, um, of uh, the, the impact on a protein is a very different phenomenon from um, uh, being a disease mutation. And this is a, a critical take home uh, point for you. In terms of disease mutations, we reckoned uh, that on average about two, or perhaps a, a range of zero to about seven, damaging disease mutations can be found per individual. So many, many fewer than the number of supposedly damaging individuals um, at, the, at the level of protein structure and function. However, in the analysis as a whole, we concluded that incidental findings, either relevant to a damaged protein or to um, potentially um, uh, disease-causing mutations, that are, are relevant to health or ill health, may be detectable in as many as 11% of uh, normal individuals as represented by the 1000 Genomes Project participants. So once again, um, the, uh, uh, there are various reasons for this discrepancy between the frequency of mutations which appear to be damaging to the protein and those which actually cause disease. The first reason may be that these variants may damage the particular protein in question, but that protein may not be actually necessary for whatever reason for the health of the carrier. Individuals um, may be asymptomatic carriers of um, particular mutant alleles, um, which um, would need to be present in homozygosity or compound heterozygosity to cause recessive disease. So they are carriers of, of these lesions and do not actually uh, express them as far as we can see in terms of um, a, a disease phenotype. Um, the mutation, of course, may be dominant, but the clinical phenotype might only be mild and classed as lying between the range, uh, within the range of normal variation. 
or the disorder may be late in onset, with expression being age or sex dependent, or the disorder may require additional genetic or environmental factors for it to manifest. Now these latter explanations lie in the realm of variable penetrance, and I'm going to spend um, quite a bit of time on um, talking about that um, today. Now, I mentioned that our way into this study was through mutation databasing. So clearly we need to um, uh, learn lessons for our own handling of, of mutation data uh, in terms of inclusion into a central mutation database. Um, we, we believe that on the basis of, of, of this study that um, spurious um, entries in HGMD are probably fewer than, uh, point, uh, fewer than 1% and maybe as low as 0.4%. Uh, but we don't, we don't feel that um, tightening our inclusion criteria would actually um, uh, do us much good because I don't think this would address the issue of, um, of reduced penetrance, which may well apply to a majority of mutations um, causing or associated with human genetic disease. So what we've done instead in terms of HGMD is with missense mutations, we have included links to flag up their predicted damage using classic um, uh, predictors of um, uh, protein uh, structure and dysfunction. And we also included data now uh, on the, uh, the variance frequency within the 1000 Genomes Project. Um, and this is for the reason that uh, instead of imposing some sort of pathogenicity score on each mutation, telling people what to believe, telling people how important a variant is or is not, we want to provide people with the basic information and then give them supporting data to allow them to make up their own minds to reach an informed, educated and intelligent decision as to whether um, these variants um, are of pathological significance in the context of their own study. So just an acknowledgement here to um, Chris Tyler Smith's group um, in, um, uh, uh, in uh, Cambridge, at, um, the, the Sanger Institute, um, without whom the this, this study would not have been possible. So I've been mentioning penetrance, and this is the topic that I want to talk about um, uh, uh, at length today. Um, penetrance, for those of you who are not familiar with the, um, with the phenomenon, refers to the proportion of those individuals harboring a particular pathogenic mutation or genotype who exhibit clinical signs of the associated disorder within a given time period. Well, that's my definition of penetrance anyway. Now, if this proportion, if this proportion um, is 100%, then the disease shows complete penetrance. In other words, every individual with the mutation shows the clinical phenotype, no problem. But in many cases, that is simply not the case. And many individuals with a given mutation do not or have not yet exhibited the clinical phenotype. And this is said to um, uh, uh, individuals with, um, uh, uh, with this sort of condition um, are said to exhibit reduced or incomplete uh, or variable penetrance. Now, the first point I want to make is that mutations are actually extremely common in the general population. So, um, for example, uh, a recent uh, study of um, cystic fibrosis um, mutations in the American population found that 2.6% of the normal American population uh, were heterozygous for at least one of um, uh, 87 different CFTR mutations. So mutations, uh, disease-causing mutations, are common in the general population. Of course, in the case of cystic fibrosis, you need also um, a mutation on the other allele for CF to manifest. Um, <coughs> A more comprehensive study um, of um, a more comprehensive study of um, uh, over 20,000 individuals for more than 400 known pathogenic mutations associated with in excess of 108 recessive diseases actually um, showed that 24 percent of us were carriers of at least one disorder. So you see. Um, 
the genetic variants that are responsible for morbidity and perhaps even eventually mortality are remarkably common in the general apparently healthy population. So it's no surprise that many of the mutations in HGMD also occur in the general population. They're there in the single dose, they're there perhaps lurking to um, spring surprises on us in later life. Okay, moving on. Um, one of the problems with studying reduced penetrance in uh, human inherited disease is that for the vast majority of studies that have ca been carried out to date, the mutations that we regard as being of pathological significance have been identified through retrospective studies of either families or groups of patients of clinically symptomatic patients. If they're already clinically symptomatic when they come to clinical attention by definition, then penetrance or a high level of penetrance, certainly in, in, obviously in the individual but also in the individual's families, may well come with the territory. What we're doing now increasingly is to look prospectively for those mutations in asymptomatic carriers, apparently healthy individuals like the Thousand Genomes Project data set. And clearly when you look for these apparently pathological mutations but in a normal population, you're performing the analysis without the bias inherent to the retrospective studies. So you're asking a completely different question, if you like, when you're performing prospective studies than when you're doing retrospective studies. So that we, we may conclude then that establishing pathogenicity in one patient really doesn't allow you to state with any degree of confidence that that mutation will in invariably give rise to the same clinical phenotype in other individuals who possess that mutation. So, uh, reduced penetrance may manifest in both dominant and recessive conditions. And let me just quickly um, uh, give you a couple examples of that. Uh, my chosen example of reduced penetrance in a dominant disorder is Factor V Leiden. Um, many of you will be familiar with this um, particular variant. Um, it exerts a, a procoagulant in, um, influence by conferring resistance to inactivation by activated protein C and as such um, increases the, the relative risk of, um, of venous thrombosis, tilts the, um, the coagulation balance in a thrombotic direction and away from a bleeding phenotype in the direction of a thrombotic phenotype. <coughs> um, now this variant is remarkably common, it occurs at a frequency of between 2 and 5 percent in at least European populations. As I've mentioned, it is, it's associated with an increased risk of venous thrombosis, but also a, a slightly increased um, risk of uh, pregnancy loss. The vast majority of Factor V Leiden carriers, however, appear to be clinically asymptomatic. So this is, um, this is a, a, an excellent example of um, uh, reduced penetrance. It's, uh, it's clearly a disease-associated variant, but it is not a disease-causing variant, at least for the majority of um, individuals who harbour that variant. Reduced penetrance in a recessive context, um, I'd probably give you this um, uh, classic hemochromatosis uh, mutation in the HFE gene. It's present in uh, a slightly lower frequency, about 1 in 200 North Europeans, but it's responsible for between 80 and 90 percent of all cases of hemochromatosis. Um, and uh, as I, as I um, have shown you in, um, in this slide, uh, something like 38 to 50 percent of homozygotes for this mutation display iron accumulation. So they display a, a laboratory phenotype which is consistent with uh, a disease risk, but only about 10 to 25 percent of the total develops any sort of um, morbidity which um, uh, uh, allows them to be tagged with the, the hemochromatosis label. Um, in addition, uh, it should be noted that the disease manifests in 20 to 43 percent of male carriers, but a much lower proportion of female carriers. And there are various other factors also, 
that appear to modify the, um, the penetrance of, um, of this uh, uh, condition. So you see that even for some um, uh, quite common mutations, um, <coughs> variable penetrance is, uh, is becoming an issue. So, thank you. So what actually is responsible for the phenomenon of, um, of variable penetrance? Well, one factor may be um, an influence of the mutation type. So in the cystic fibrosis, uh, penetrance can vary quite dramatically between different mutations. So the common phenylalanine 508 uh, mutation, which causes most cystic fibrosis, um, the penetrance of this mutation is very high. But there are other mutations where the penetrance is very low. The best example to date of uh, studies um, on um, the, the influence of mutation on, on uh, the penetrance of a disease comes from retinoblastoma. And um, the, the low penetrance mutations in this disorder, in the RB1 gene, tend to lead to a, either a reduction in the amount of RB protein, perhaps through promoter mutations or splice site mutations, or they result in a partially functional RB molecule um, as a consequence of a, of a missense mutation or probably a, um, a, an in-frame deletion. But uh, the more drastic mutations that actually knock out the function of the protein, these are, um, are much more um, high penetrance um, um, mutations. But relatively few genes have been subjected to the, um, the same intensity of, um, of research as, uh, as the RB gene. So uh, I hesitate to generalize too much um, uh, in terms of the influence of the mutation type. Um, there may be additional allelic influences in cis that is uh, linked on the same chromosome to, to the mutation. So in this slide, there are um, a, a number of, um, of different examples of linked uh, polymorphisms which appear to uh, mod moderate or modulate the, the penetrance of a particular um, disease mutation. So the mutation may manifest more with a particular allele of one polymorphism than with the other allele of, of, of that polymorphism. Uh, incidentally, um, uh, those of you who are interested in individual examples, while I um, uh, reference those examples briefly um, on screen as I pass over them, for those of you who are interested um, should uh, access our recent review on uh, reduced penetrance, and I'll give you the reference to that um, later, so um, you can chase these references if you're interested in the, in, in the detail. <clears throat> um, one particular um, example that I want to share with you is um, uh, a combination of apparently neutral uh, SNPs, which when combined can um, give rise to a, a state which appears as if it's um, uh, of, of, um, uh, uh, due to, um, to a single pathological mutation. And this is quite interesting when one's uh, exploring the border country between um, um, disease susceptibility and disease causation. So two examples um, uh, here of um, uh, apparently neutral SNPs in the FMO3 gene, which um, when they occur together on the same allele cause a decrease in enzymatic activity of the FMO3 protein that's sufficient to give rise to a mild form of trimethylaminuria. Um, the second um, SNP need not, of course, be at, on, on the, at the same locus. And so I'll give you an example here of, um, of two SNPs in, uh, in, in different genes, indeed unlinked genes, that uh, when they occur together appear to increase the risk of uh, lumbar disc um, herniation. So I suspect that um, qu uh, quite a few examples of, of common disease um, may be inherited in, in, in a similar manner to these. But by their very nature, these um, types of disease mechanism um, are difficult um, to, to spot, difficult to, um, uh, to, to research. So that's probably why they're as yet few in number. Um, but it also shows why there are disease-causing, sorry, disease-associated mutations or disease-associated um, variants or lesions in HGMD, which also occur in the wider um, population. G 
Gene expression may also be uh, important in determining whether a mutation comes to clinical uh, attention or not. Um, so this is um, actually a wonderful example um, from uh, uh, a couple of papers now um, on uh, a retinoblastoma, uh, a bigger pardon, a retinitis pigmentosa um, type um, caused by mutations in the PRPF31 uh, gene. And the mutation, uh, the, the, um, whether the, um, um, the individual expresses RP or not depends on the level of wild type PRPF31 mRNA expression. So if you look at cells from asymptomatic carriers of uh, mutations that cause this form of RP, um, the, the cells from asymptomatic carriers express a higher level of the wild type allele than cells from affected patients. So there's some sort of threshold effect going on that if you express enough of the wild type allele, you avoid the, the disease phenotype. So it follows that anything that can perturb the expression of that gene will influence the penetrance of the, the inherited mutation. So, uh, for example, um, it, it's now been shown that um, uh, the penetrance of, um, of these uh, PRPF31 mutations is reduced by transcriptional repression mediated by a product of a closely linked gene, this um, C03 gene um, on 19Q. But interestingly, um, it's also been shown that um, the PRPF31 expression is, uh, is influenced by um, uh, a QTL, that's a, it's a variant um, uh, influencing the expression level um, of the gene, which is on a completely uh, unlinked uh, chromosome. So we can see here that um, We've, we've got potential influences on the expression of, of, this, um, uh, of mutations at this locus, not only from the locus itself, but also a closely linked locus and from a, um, a completely unlinked locus. So if, if, this, if this model of um, uh, the modulation of mutation penetrance is um, uh, anything approaching generalizable, it gives us a glimpse of the complexity that we're dealing with when we're um, trying to uh, navigate that tortuous route from um, uh, mutant genotype to predicted clinical phenotype. In, um, in formal terms, um, autosomal dominance implies that um, uh, homozygotes will ex exhibit the same clinical phenotype as heterozygotes. But in practice, Clinical symptoms are usually more severe in homozygotes than in, in heterozygotes. And uh, i give you a few examples um, uh, here. So this shows you that um, there's an influence of um, allele dosage as well. That um, influence of um, uh, allele dosage comes into its own with um, uh, a potential influence of copy number variation. As I mentioned um, uh, um, um, from our slide, um, on the 1000 Genomes Project. And probably um, a best example I can give you of that is that um, there's a case of a fetus that possessed nonsense mutations inherited from the mother and the father in the CYP21A2 gene. But um, this, um, in, uh, the, this fetus lacked the normal um, uh, sequelae of congenital adrenal hyperplasia because there was a duplication of the CYP21A2 gene on the paternal allele. So when is a mutation not a mutation? When it's covered by a copy number variation. And I think this is a phenomenon that will become increasingly apparent as we start to merge data on um, uh, um, uh, um, traditional classical mutations in genes with, um, um, with um, uh, copy number variation data. Um, then there's the influence of modifier genes, um, and uh, I give you a couple of examples here in, in Hirschsprung disease, um, and uh, also in uh, uh, long, uh, long QT um, syndrome. I'm having to rush 
through these slides a little because I'm aware of um, the time constraints um, that I have today and we started a little late. One of the most interesting phenomena and I think emerging phenomena in, in, in human molecular genetics is, is digenic inheritance. And strictly speaking, digenic inheritance is the interaction of mutations in two completely different genes but which are required for the expression of the clinical phenotype. Now the classic one was mutation, uh, heterozygous mutations of RDS and ROM um, causing retinitis pigmentosa. So a single heterozygous mutation in, in, in both genes. Um, but um, since this uh, was first reported, I think something like 15, 20 years ago, um, we see a number of other different types of um, diagenic inheritance which are emerging. Um, so, uh, usually the, the proteins um, in which um, uh, these mutations arise are um, associated um, with each other in some way. They may be different subunits of a multimeric protein, as with the RDS-ROM situation. They may be different subunits of um, an uh, oligomeric uh, protein complex, receptor ligand pairs, and, and, and so on. So there's an emerging, if you like, classificatory system of, um, of diagenic um, uh, in inheritance um, here. Um, this leads us on, really, to naturally to, to, to oligogenic inheritance, where there are um, certain conditions which appear to be the product of more than two uh, mutations in more than, in, in more than two genes. And uh, I'll give you some, some examples um, uh, on, on this um, slide of oligogenic um, inheritance where um, three or even four mutations may combine to affect um, a, a, a clinical phenotype. So we can envisage a, some sort of um, a, a continuum, if you like, between uh, the classical monogenic disorders through oligogenic disorders, such as the digenic uh, and, and oligogenic disorders that I've just been describing, all the way through to polygenic disorders responsible for um, complex disease. And you can see um, uh, in this cartoon, there's a trend um, for the, the increase, uh, for there to be an increase in, in frequency of the variant as one proceeds from monogenic towards polygenic. Um, but similarly, a decrease in the individual variant effect, the individual um, effect of each variant as one involves more, more variants. So, if you like, this is a model for, um, uh, um, for how we should approach um, uh, studies of complex disease. Um, I need to briefly um, uh, mention uh, the influence of uh, gender, uh, whether you're male or female, on various um, conditions. Uh, Age-dependent penetrance is a, is a classic phenomenon, and um, uh, perhaps um, I'll, I'll give you um, uh, this single example of um, a mutation in the TTR gene, uh, which uh, is uh, um, associated with familial amyloid polyneuropathy. The, the penetrance of this um, of this disease, if you possess this mutation, is only about 1.7% until the age of 30. By age of 60, it's still at about 22%, and even by age of 90, it only reaches about 69%. So, whether you're manifesting um, this uh, uh, condition or not depends um, very largely on, um, on how old you are in, in, the, in the case of this particular mutation. So again, it's not terribly surprising um, that um, there is an overlap between HGMD and, um, and the normal population um, in terms of the, the Thousand Genomes Project. Epigenetic influences, um, I haven't really got time to, um, to go over, but um, suffice to say that they exist, and um, people are, are starting now to, to go beyond um, the, the sort of um, traditional X inactivation studies, which is uh, the classical cause of um, variable penetrance due to, um, uh, uh, due to uh, epigenetic uh, um, phenomena to, um, to studies of monozygotic twins which are discordant for a particular disorder. And there are at least a couple of examples here where um, uh, th these monozygotic twins um, that uh, possess the same mutation 
um, but uh, they're discordant in terms of the clinical phenotype, also show discordant methylation status in the context of a particular gene. Lastly, in terms of um, um, what I've got to say on penetrance, there are gene-environment interactions which are, are, are likely to be um, very important. And uh, uh, I've given you a couple of, um, of examples here. Um, melano risk of melanoma, for example, um, coupled with inherited differences in skin pigmentation. But of course, this risk is modifiable in terms of, um, of where you live and, um, and whether you expose yourself to the sun uh, a lot or not. Um, risk of lung cancer um, clearly is um, uh, going to be associated with lifestyle choices in terms of um, whether you smoke or not. And an inherited predisposition to obesity is uh, potentially modifiable both by diet and uh, physical activity. So we've got a whole variety of different um, factors that um, impact on clinical penetrance. And uh, these, of course, um, uh, are not um, isolated. Probably in the case of uh, every single mutation, we, we have um, uh, issues of this um, nature. We have influences of, um, uh, impacting uh, on the penetrance, determining whether a particular mutant genotype will uh, be clinically expressed or not. And for those of you who are interested in the, in, in the detail, uh, I refer you to this um, uh, recent review article uh, in Human Genetics, um, where genotype is not predictive of phenotype. And you can get um, further details um, of um, uh, um, the, the examples that I've given you today, and many more besides um, in, in that paper. For if I've got um, uh, just uh, uh, a few more minutes, I want to show you what happens when we try and um, put um, what we've learned about um, penetrance into practice. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that um, we do um, get some critical mail um, as well as fan mail, and um, one of our, our staunchest critics has been um, uh, Les Biesecker um, at uh, Bethesda, and um, Les and, uh, and I have um, had uh, long discussions about um, quite what to do about the issue of reduced penetrance. And uh, the best thing to do with your critics, um, I would say, I would strongly recommend, the best thing to do with your critics is to get to know them and work with them. And that's exactly what we did with, uh, with Les Biesecker. And uh, in this particular study that I want to show you a, um, a couple of slides on, um, what, Les, what Les's lab did was to perform exome sequencing on a total of 870 participants, critically not selected for arrhythmia, cardiomyopathy, or a family history of sudden death, okay? But these exome data were then um, studied for 22 cardiac, known cardiac arrhythmia and 41 cardiomyopathy-associated genes. Uh, so what we were doing was looking for variation um, in those um, 63 genes um, and filtering those results and then comparing them to HGMD data. We ended up with a total of um, over 1,300 variants in the cardiomyopathy genes and 360 variants in the arrhythmia genes. I don't want to go into um, Leser's um, ClinSeq criteria for, um, uh, for gene variant assignment of pathogenicity, but this, there are lots of different pathogenicity scales. But I, I just want to point out that there are five classes, and class one is, is pathogenic, class four is likely pathogenic, class three are variants of uncertain significance, and um, uh, then we have um, uh, cl class two and, uh, and class one, which are uh, likely not pathogenic and benign, respectively. So, I mean, there are different ways one can perform this sort of classification, and one can argue about it until the cows come home. But um, uh, th these were the five classes that Les used, and um, this sort of classification is typical of the sort of classification which is now being introduced um, into this type of study. Now, I want to show you, I want to show you um, this summary cartoon of, um, uh, of what um, the results were. From the cardiomyopathy-associated variants, 
you'll see that um, the class fives, that is the, um, the pathogenic, the certainly pathogenic lesions, are actually a remarkably small proportion of what were found. The class four are s uh, similarly small but rather larger, the, the likely pathogenics. Class three are variants of uncertain significance, while the rest are, the class one and two are probably benign. And you see a similar pattern for the arrhythmia-associated variants by pathogenicity class. So you've got two problems here. There's only a very small proportion that you, you, you actually think um, are definitely of pathological significance, and you've got a very large proportion, the class threes, um, which, are, um, uh, which are variants of uncertain significance. We focused on um, the, uh, the class fives, and we, we found that um, six of these, actually, when you looked at them um, uh, in, in, in detail, performed um, heart analyses, including uh, echo, one found um, um, uh, evidence of a clinical phenotype, even although the individuals weren't expressing um, any, any, any disease. So something like 0.5% of participants in this study, looking at only at um, 60 relevant genes, had pathogenic variants in known uh, cardiopathy or arrhythmia genes. So I think we can conclude from this, uh, this study, and the reason why I wanted to show you is that an attempt to build a, a pathogenicity class system is only semi-useful in, in the context of, um, uh, of, of, of diagnosis because it, it doesn't really lend itself naturally to mutations which are characterized by reduced or incomplete penetrance, such as many of the, of, of the lesions that we picked up. Attributing pathogenicity scores in a diagnostic context is a very different game from mutation databasing because we've got to include everything that might uh, be of clinical significance in, in, in a relevant database, whereas if you're a diagnostician, you mustn't um, uh, focus on anything other than, um, uh, than disease-causing uh, mutations. And I quote here, um, I quote here from um, uh, Leza's um, uh, paper, um, it's critical to recognize that our assessment of benign or probably benign is limited to the specific context of using such a variant for personalized medicine and should not, repeat not, be interpreted as, meeting, as, as meaning that the variant has no role in the pathogenicity of the conditions under study. So as long as we're all clear as to what we're setting out to achieve, I think it's quite acceptable and, and indeed um, probably wholly appropriate for the ground rules to differ between the diagnostic setting and the mutation databasing setting. So what we hope is, um, uh, and uh, what we hope has come out of this, um, uh, this collaboration between Leza's um, group and our own, is that um, we're moving towards a system um, by which the mutation databasing and the diagnostic communities are um, um, developing um, that can be introduced to allow um, uh, our different strategies to coexist a little more comfortably than they have um, an, until now. So my last slide gives you um, um, a slightly tongue-in-cheek um, uh, cartoon. Um, I think this is some sort of yoga class and um, they're clearly looking for um, enlightenment on the road um, uh, um, to interpret the um, uh, the difficult to understand relationship between the uh, mutant genotype and the clinical phenotype and some bright spark is saying are we there yet well I'll leave that um, uh, answer to yourselves in the audience today thank you very much indeed for your attention <laughs>